guys welcome to another episode of fearless thank you so much for staying with us and watching all the episodes and uh, if you're new hi my name is Tracy and welcome uh, to fearless this is an exciting journey not only for me but for you too so today we're gonna be talking about a very controversial topic many people don't like to talk about it I don't know why but uh, today we want to learn we want to um, really share our experiences. I mean, after we saw what happened in the States, after George Floyd was brutally murdered, a lot of things came up, a lot of social injustices, a lot of um, social inequalities, and people now start talking about it. So one of the things that we were talking about on Twitter, because Kenyans really have active Twitter fingers, is colorism and how it's very prevalent in Nairobi, but we do not talk about it. So to help me talk about this subject are four amazing people and they know what they're talking about, not really know what they're talking about, but they're sharing their experiences and um, educating us more about this topic. And not educating us because they are professionals, they are educating us because of their experiences and what they think about this topic and uh, that of course within their capacity so sit tight if you have any comments by the end of this episode please let us know and uh yeah enjoy this one hey my name is michael i'm in private development i like to eat uh traditional food ethiopian that is and uh southern cuisine from home What's up guys, it's your girl Lulu Kenya. I am an experiential marketer and singer-songwriter, recording artist as well. I like to eat food, period. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Wangare. I am from Kenya, born and raised. I am a lawyer and yeah, just like everyone else here, I think we all enjoy eating. Thank you guys for coming and uh, yeah, this is gonna be a very amazing episode because I think for more than anything, this is a learning experience for, for us, um, just to understand the dynamics of things and where we're at, because I feel like we don't really talk about this in, uh, with our friends, even in the society, you don't go somewhere and people actively talk about this. It's just one of those things that are like closed doors. So now, when was the first time you experienced colorism? Or do we even know what that means? So for yeah, anyone who doesn't, okay. yeah, we could start there. Start there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. what is colorism? That's we're all looking at him because yeah, we're like, so <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and we end you. All right, so colorism, as it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has different definitions in Africa and Southeast Asia and also in America, right? So first and foremost, it's not a black thing, right? It's just a around the world thing. So colorism just looks at how uh, throughout the world, darker complexion people have always had it a bit tougher, right? From ancient India to modern day Africa and everything in between. It's yeah. basically like society's overt preference for lighter skin, skin shades um, when it comes to people even within the same race. So that's why it's like, it makes no sense at all. At all. Yeah. So now it brings me, what would you say was the first thing that someone told you that made you realize, oh, yeah, by the way, colorism, um, exists. Um, I feel like for me it definitely happened at a very young age. I did go to school in Kenya and in my school I was the lightest person there and I it was always there was always very like you know these comments for oh mzungu or like if I because I was really so I'm not very like into sports um, but I so I created my <laughs> So I, me. so I created my own <laughs> so I created my own sport you know how you hula hoop mm -hmm. so running with a hula hoop I made it a sport and I was like the best in the school obviously because I was the one who created it right and so that became like a really big issue guys were just like oh why can't she just um, play other sports is it because she's white and that's why she's getting this privilege to be able to create her own sport because da 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 and I was like well I'm half white but okay it doesn't matter right because you wouldn't see that so I feel like for me it's just always it's always been there it's always been the whole Muzungu mm -hmm. whites um, but like being older I was even telling you guys earlier on how my uber drivers are always like hey well where's you naishida where's you naishida you know and it's just like uh -huh -huh. it's like banter but you know I'll, I'll be like okay I get maybe where you're coming from but then why does it feel this way yeah. you know yeah like 
doesn't sit well. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. sit well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What about you, Michelle? I think for me, it's a lot of. You always hear this compliment as a dark skinned person uh, that you are pretty for a dark skinned person. It sounds so backhanded. A compliment and the thing stops. Is, why, does yeah. it, why, why does it have to be a comparison? Exactly. You why know? does it have to a be a comparison? A compliment stops at pretty. Exactly. You're exactly. pretty. Finished. Doesn't need to have other things. It's so internalized in our society because you realize that people see these things not even without giving it a second thought. Yes. It's just something that's just so within us and it's just really unfortunate. Well, you know, like for me, I was very blessed that like I got the chance to grow up in, in Houston in the late 90s and early 2000s, right? Like Houston as a city is one of the most diverse cities in the country. Um, I mean, all types of people were there. But nonetheless, you always have, uh, you know, I'll never forget the first time I heard the expression, oh, but you're not really black, right? Mm. I'm like, my brother, I don't know what you call this, but sour, all right? Uh, I don't even know what that means. Or at the same time, it's like you find yourself in a position of not fitting certain stereotypes that people have of yeah. black men, yeah. especially black men in America. Do you yeah. trying to say black men don't cheat? I'm kidding. No, yes, <laughs> no, no, they don't. Black men do not cheat. They do not cheat. Men cheat, not black men. No, I'm kidding. Huh? Black men like Men cheat. <laughs> Period. What? He said black men multiply. No, men cheat, men cheat, period. Oh, I get yeah. it. Oh, I get it. <laughs> okay, now you started. Oh, I know. You I know. started this. I think uh, my experience was I really never knew where to fit in, hmm. you know? Because it's like, okay, when you're with people who look Kenyan, they're like, ah, but when you zoom, apana unong get soily, apana unajaki ko you, ay uongo, you know such comments. Yeah. Or for example, like you can never fit in, and you yeah. also you do you can't really hang out with the other people because it's like okay, you don't really fit in. Yeah. Who who's who's claiming Where me? Where do I go? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah, do yeah, I yeah. really belong here? And even when I was as I continued to grow even into my career, it's like. People don't really think I'm Kenyan. They're like, "Ah, we're going to create content." Yeah. She thinks yeah. she she yeah. thinks yeah. yeah she she thinks you know what I mean. Yeah, at a very you. young age. Um, how has the experience been different for you and your mom? She's a dark-skinned woman, and then you're biracial. So mm. I think I remember one time we'd gone to an Italian restaurant in town, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let us in. And I remember my mom being like. Mbona, you can't let us in. Is it because we are black? And at that time, I was young, so I didn't understand what the hell yeah. was happening, yeah. you know? And they completely refused because people would... They didn't refuse at you seeing here, mm. but what they were... They couldn't let us in. They're like, oh, it's space. But then someone walked in who was lighter, and it was like a white guy. Yeah, and they course. let him in. So yeah. that's when she started causing, yeah. right? Yeah. Taking it back to what you said about um, who's claiming me. So for me... Um, I grew up with my mom, so my dad is white, my mom is black, right? And so for me, I never saw them as a white dad and a black mom. They were just mom and dad. And when I, when I got older, because my parents never really talked to me about um, being, that I would be treated a certain kind of way or not. I was just growing up, right? So I learned that, I was even telling Michelle earlier on, I've never looked at someone and thought, I'm gonna treat this person a certain kind of way because of the color of their skin. I'm gonna act a certain kind of way because of the color of their skin. Yeah. I'm just going to act the, or talk the way I do, you know? So then where is the problem then? Um, I think when you look at the inception of this thing, uh, I mean, colorism is in many different places, right? So when you look at ancient India till today, you have the caste system, right? And the whole colorism notion comes from that uh, the darker you are in the ancient world, that means you are a laborer, you are a farmer, and the fairer you were, the more you are indoors, right? Now, bringing it back to us black folks and us Africans, where it only really just matters, you know, it reminds me of what Brother Huey P. Newton said, right? One of the three founding members of the Black Panthers. And so what he said was, if you in your mind as a Negro accept and believe that you are more superior than a blacker complexion Negro because you're fair skinned, you have subconsciously accepted the fact that as a light skinned Negro, the white man is more superior than you because on the metric of complexion, yeah. right? And so colorism in the United States, for example, and this complexion of light skin, yellow bone, red bone, dark, all that nonsense, 
that actually started as a framework of oppressing people and their own outlook to themselves, right? And this all starts back at the breeding farms and the sex farms where slave masters would literally breed us like we were uh, spring chicken or bucks or horses. And now, of course, we heard it in uh, Jay-Z's song, uh, Django, light skin, dark skin, still a nigga. And so where that comes from is that like during these sex farms where the white slave owners would rape these African, then of course you have a baby, right? The lighter skin babies that were the byproduct of a slave master's raping of that woman or man is now what you call the house Negro, right? And then the dark skin was working on the slave, was considered a buck, was considered just this brute and such, right? And then furthermore down the road, when you look at it, especially like in today, industry labels and how it is, the type of music and art that they propagate, mm -hmm. it, it is the most toxic thing that exists now because it goes back to how we are continuously being manipulated in our perception of ourselves as a people, mm -hmm. right? But what we don't realize is that it doesn't matter. Yeah. One of the funniest memes that I saw during the whole protest that happened four or five weeks ago was, um, you know, we have a, a great deal of colorism exists in the Caribbean, right? And so it was, you know, it was a Dominican guy saying, oh, I'm not black, I'm Dominican. And the caption said, good luck explaining that to a racist white cop as he beats your ass. Mm -hmm. Because you are a black man. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you True. are, you know, dark as night yeah. or fair skin, yeah. right? And it's something that we have to collectively understand as a people, this is a divisive tool, right? Because it's not real. It doesn't mean anything. At all. And the sooner we understand that, we, 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 we find a convergence of uniting as a people mm -hmm. and, you know, stitching the fabric that was cut. Yeah. Right. And, you know, uh, you really don't understand the effects that it um, has. First of all, let's talk about friendships, mm -hmm. right? So I'm sure we have our experiences with that. So maybe we can yeah. all talk about how it's maybe affected or not affected your friendships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we were best friends when we were young, growing up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we grew up together. Mm -hmm. um, I think plus what? Four, five, Boy, six. When you guys were wearing we ugly ass no, uniforms. Let me tell you, we even transferred to a different school <laughs> that had was <laughs> <laughs> uniform. Yeah. You don't even want to see. But um, I think for me, when it comes to friendships, and just looking at the society that I'm in, and the kind of people that I've been exposed to, majority of the people here are dark skinned. So. Even when I went to school, everyone looked the same. And then up until Tracy came, I'm not saying I befriended her because she was light skin, no, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, we just became friends. And to be honest, I genuinely just thought like, well, I think when you came, it was just like, okay, she's a new person. I mean, I could be nice to her. We could become friends. And then one thing led to another. We used to yeah. have sleepovers and things like that. And then just created beautiful memories. Yeah. So for me, I don't think I've had that much of a, of an interaction with, let's say, I'm gravitating towards lighter skinned people or towards darker skinned people. It's just like people whom I'm exposed to and whom I interact with. And I don't think I've felt a situation where I'm seated at a table with lighter skinned people and I feel inferior. I'm just like, okay, uh, these are people. We're having a conversation. We, we are yeah. friends. For me, my lens has been to look at people as human beings. Mm -hmm. I think also I can say that because I've been privileged enough to be educated and to be exposed also to environments where I'm able to meet and interact with people of different races. Yeah. That's not the same for majority of the people mm. that we have around here. Mm. Um, and that's why you see that this thing is just so internalized that people will be able to tell you, you know, mm. when, when you're in an Uber because you're light skin and automatically they All assume the that you are you know, well off, yeah. you're richer, and um, it's like you owe them something. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate that that's the situation for majority of the people, and it's been internalized to that extent. Yeah. But um, it's upon us now to change for future generations. And I think for me, the most important tool is to educate. That's the only way you can change people. Uh, so I want to segue from what uh, Lulu and Michelle were saying men are really actually the main perpetrators and the, the main issues of such issues that we have now. The root of all issues in the world is toxic masculinity, right? And the different uh, variations of it, right? So 
um, what it is is that like this is a more damaging and internalizing problem more for black women than it is for black men. First and foremost, like our African sisters and our black sisters have been subjugated to this ridiculous and personally, in my opinion, very tacky standard of Eurocentric beauty, right? Mm -hmm. Where ironically though, uh, white women and European women are trying to look like black women, yes. right? Yes. So that in itself already should show you the twisted pervasion that is colorism and what it stands behind it, right? So I believe when it comes to preference, you have preference of, you know, do you like the dumbbell or the barbell when you're doing flat benching, right? Yeah. Uh, I the, like, hey. You know what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> that dumbbell or barbell, right? Like yeah. that's that's a preference, right? Yeah, do you sure. like, uh, you know, do you like sneakers or loafers, right? But when it comes to now a relationship of a partner, a life partner, you're looking at preference of character, preference of like, man, is that going to be the mother of my children? Is that going to be the, the the father of my children, yeah. right? These are the things that you look at. Preference is for touch and go, right? It's not yeah. for lasting relationships. And so, you know, uh, th th this colorism thing, it has so many roots and so many faces of how it used to come. And so I think for us, if we're going to heal from anything, you know, what a lot of people do in communication problems, right? Communication is A to B or A to millions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a lot of times is that people address the symptoms of an issue rather than the the inflammation, right? A good doctor doesn't give you uh, symptoms, uh, medication for your runny nose, your headache, and your fever. Yeah. A good doctor gives you the antibiotic or the or probiotic to get rid of the inflammation of it, right? Yes. So I'm sure you guys and many people who are watching now have had communication gaps of they're fighting about symptoms instead of the issue <laughs> itself, right? Yeah. The most important thing that we have to take away from such you know bullshit you know social construct that is colorism is the fact that this was a tool of our oppressors. Mm -hmm. You know, the trick, the, the, the really brilliant thing about the, 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 the white supremacy framework is that it, it works like clockwork, mm -hmm. right? Because all you have to do is make somebody hate themselves. Yeah, Once you hate them yourself, you then hate anything that looks like you. Yes. Hence why we have such a high propensity towards violence of black men towards black men. Uh, but aside from that, then you look at the kind of art that comes out right yeah. the one that gets the most airtime and play and attention and radio and video and whatever the hell else and then the ones that don't right yeah. conscious music doesn't get it but because hip-hop and rap although now it's become more lewd i still vibe with it because it has stayed true and organic to 100%. its essence right hip-hop and rap comes from traditional, it goes from jazz, then from jazz to uh, 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 swing and rock and roll, because black men created rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And then aside from that as well, it goes back to slave anthems, the Negro anthems, right? It is a continual sustainment of storytelling because it comes from here, from Africa, and then it made its way there, right? It's storytelling. Nowadays, when you know, you're rapping about, you know, F that guy, that be there, yeah, it's lewd and it's uncomfortable, but they're still telling you their story, story right? You listen to all these bullshit rappers and the things that they say about black women, right? And then now, what do you expect them to feel about yeah. themselves? But this, is what, this, is, but this goes back to what I was saying about how black men and men in general, starting with white men, then black men picking up the slack, perpetuated this colorism nonsense, mm. right? And that's what we have to realize to it. And we can't start talking about, well, you know, like you have to be more open-minded or this or that or that. That's all bullshit. Yeah. Right? The reality of it is that you have to look at your oppressor right in his eye and understand what the issues are and call it as it is. Yeah. We have gone too long as a people trying to give passes and trying to give True. justifications and politically correct True. explanations as to why they are. No, Talk this is a tool it. of enslaving a people now mentally. So now which brings me to internalized racism, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you, you, you were talking about it earlier on, about having some sort of like inferior complex. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely there. Okay, maybe I shouldn't speak generally, but it's just something that's there. Um, have you ever been to a gathering where, okay, well, I don't know, where a white person comes, <laughs> like I'm thinking about the traditional wedding ceremony. So we have the ratio, ratio. Yeah. and then a white person walks in. The you will see, the they'll set More up the table, the you will room. get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's something that's so deep-rooted deep rooted in us. So the thing is, if something has been learned, then it can be unlearned. 
for me, the only way that we can ever get out of this is by consciously making an effort to unlearn certain things. Can it be unlearned? Do you think that? Uh, yeah, that's what I was gonna yeah, say. Yeah, do you it think it's unlearned? like okay, uh, two plus two is five? No, it's two plus no, no, two no. is four, right? Do you think yeah. it's learning, like an intellectual growth process, or do you think it's a conditioning? It's more of a conditioning. Mm. It's more of a conditioning yeah. um, because um, if you ask. My granddad, there's a time I was having a conversation with him, and he told me how he used to work for an insurance company. And even when he was there, of course, his um, bosses were white people. So even when their kids used to come, my granddad would have to, have to um, speak to their children in a certain manner. Like he had to remove his hat, he used, he used to be like, Buona, you know? And these are children. These, so imagine them as white kids seeing that yes, and yeah. how they would view a black person because to them from then on it's like okay you know what this, this is person normal. is inferior to yeah. me this is normal this mm -hmm. is how life should be for me and that's why some of them don't even understand yeah. why um why life has to go to a place of equality and i saw something on twitter yesterday which said that if you are accustomed to privilege then equality feels like oppression mm -hmm. you know, like my personal experience in nairobi alone because i've never had to deal with this back in houston uh, I've been the most refreshing reality check for a lot of the bigoted Muindi and white population of Nairobi in particular. Mm. Yeah, a reality check. I'm like, my brother, I'm an Ethiopian who grew up in Texas. Don't try this with me, all right? But aside from that, what that brings me to is that aside from chewing your ass out, after I chew your ass out, I'm going to reserve a certain moment that is going to be a teachable moment, mm. right? Mm. So after I scold you on your ignorance, then I'm going to tell you, you know, uh, very accurately and intellectually honestly why you're ignorant right mm -hmm. and so as i do that you know a lot of the reasons like so i'm in private development right so private development firm we look at economic disparity gaps across africa right here's what lulu michelle and trey needs but this is what they can only afford bridget right yeah. that's what we do so the number one thing in our consultancy side that we also always tell foreigners that are looking to come in uh is that Leave your business ideas, leave your products, leave your services, leave all that. The number one key thing in Africa is the social dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because somebody whose last name is Obia and somebody whose last name is Washera, their mentalities and their worlds and their understanding of the world is very different, right? And that goes for the rest of the 53 countries, right? We are a continent and a people over 5,000 tribes, right? And tens of thousands of languages. So, you know, we have adopted so many practices that are inorganic to us, right? As African people, as black people, we've adopted forms of faith, forms of commerce, forms of governance that are not organic to us, right? How did we manage from the dawn of time till the 17th century when the first slave ships came, very fine and efficiently, but then shit went to shit in the last 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so that comes back to now a practice that we've adopted that are inorganic to us, right? Like as a man, you have a certain, like, like I, I look at gender as equity. I don't look at it as equality because it doesn't make sense. Give a woman what's a woman's, give a man what's a man's, right? It, it, equality is like, why are you, like, it doesn't make sense, right? So the things that bestowed and the responsibility of that, like women are natural cultivators. They're natural creators. They're natural multipliers, right? Give a woman a seat, she gives you a life. Give a woman a house, she gives you a home. And men, we have this thing that is, like it has a nurturing, protective nature, but if we're not protecting our women, our black women, then we're leaving you guys stranded out for all these foreigners for, that, that, that look at you, and this is a topic that is willfully neglected, the, fetish, the fetishization and the sexualization of the black woman. Do they woman. call it jungle fever? It, it goes both ways, right? Uh -huh. It's it, like man to woman, woman to man. But the main thing that is the, the, the sexualization and the fetishization of black women right and the preferential scale like you're going into a, a weed dispensary in amsterdam and picking exactly what you want in your joint right yeah, yeah. and that is not what it is and we as black men have failed you all right because we even ourselves i know so many people that that come in, in, amongst my space and once in a while that will say things like oh i want that lady i want that black. i'm like mm -hmm. your mother's black yeah. yeah what do you think is your role because i remember you were talking about ella fitzgerald and because of, for example, Marilyn Monroe knew that she had a privilege, so she was able 
to take Ella to all the different clubs so that she could play because they wouldn't let her Frank play. Sinatra, exactly. Yeah. And Ella Fitzgerald became the first woman, black woman, to win a Grammy. So what is your role? I think one of yours like, um, I know is you never let a moment not be a teachable moment. Uh, for me, uh, whether it's uh, any of my peers, associates, friends, uh, elders who make stupid comments, uh, checking them right there and then, and then also, you know, you have to champion on behalf of the women that you call your sisters, right? Mm -hmm. Like, these are the women that are going to continue the continuation of people who look like me, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. I don't need things to be whited out and washed out along the way, yeah. right? I need a continuation of people. Yeah. And also, in addition to that, yeah, teachable moments are important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very inquisitive person. So for me, I, I, I love it when someone can teach me more about something that I'm either struggling to understand or just curious about. So for me, I had a, a discussion with my boss the other day. I was complaining about something about the Kenyan music industry and he was like, you can sit here and complain like everybody else or you can do something to change it. And so for me, I, I, feel like, I feel like everyone will look at a person and think, I'll listen to Michael speak and I'm learning. People are so afraid of, of learning. Michael knows what he's talking about. I feel like people fear that also. I try, I try my absolute best because my best friend is also very knowledgeable on these kind of topics and she's like extremely aggressive with making sure that it's drilled into um, your mind every day. And I just feel like for me, I try my best to stay very curious, inquisitive, um, and learning about these things because then when I am a mom, from my lips to God's ears, I am able to teach my kids A, B, C, D. Right? We can only pray that it, it'll be different then, hopefully. But I feel like for me, I, I try my best to make sure that I am taking in the knowledge that, that someone else has. But so for me, I just feel like I want to make sure that what I'm learning, I'm passing on sure, all sure. the time. I have a for Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is really important that your viewers, you know, peep this, yeah? Lulu, how do you discern between somebody who is willfully ignorant because it maintains their bias, mm -hmm. right? Their hate, their bigotry, uh, jealousy, mm -hmm. right? Half the world is jealous of all of you, mm -hmm. right? And then somebody who generally doesn't know. How do you discern between willful ignorance and ignorance? I think that it's hard, obviously, mm -hmm. um, because it's the same thing with the, with the whole preference thing. How do you know if someone is just, if, a, if it's a preference or if it's a society? Honestly, just like everything else, I honestly feel like it's something that time will tell. I think um, also, possibly a way that you could also um, discern is a person's capacity to empathize. Because for me, I feel like if you're able to empathize with a person's struggle, mm -hmm. then it shows that you have the capacity to change mm -hmm. or the willingness. Because if you can feel my pain, then you wouldn't want to inflict it on me. And therefore, you have the capacity yeah. to change and to want to do better. Yeah. So possibly that's just a way. Yeah. Um, but I, th I guess since we are wrapping yeah. up, mm -hmm. um, my role, I'd say, is for me, I can only work off of the experiences that I've had. Um, I can sit here and say, you know, I've been called a skin all my life and I don't accept the kind of person that I am. But I've reached a point of acceptance. I mean, this is something that I'm not willing to change. I I truly believe I'm beautiful. So for me, it's the people that I'm interacting with, my younger cousins, my nieces, mm -hmm. um, my aunties, it's to reinforce that kind of acceptance yeah. in them, especially for the younger ones. Um, I feel like they need to have someone that they can look up to and see, okay, yeah, she's confident. She's okay with who she is. So what makes me different? I look exactly like her. And you know, society today has put up like a poster child of every dark skinned woman once in every 10 years. So we'll have Lupita today and Viola Davis being put up as, oh, a celebration of dark skinned women. But it's, yeah. it's not enough when you don't even know how to photograph them, when you don't know how to yeah. put them out to the world. So um, I think for me, my role is to ensure that if I can pass that to the people that I'm exposed to, my yeah. younger um, 
cousins, nephews, mm. nieces, then it's just a step forward into expanding that because it's just something that's going to spread just like the virus. You got that from the, <laughs> the what do you call it, the, the Putsuga, what's her name, the, the, the gold medalist? Uh, Simone Biles. Simone Biles, thank yes. you. When you say you don't know how to photograph, I was, yeah. I was, I was really, really, yeah. very, yeah. very Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking also, about. Also, be mm. like Michael, call these people out. Oh yeah, I I, I know mean, very many. Out, but, you know, some guy, one of the people in the crew, be like, yeah, bro, da 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 point da da. I'm like, bro, you're sick. Thank you so much for your honesty. We couldn't keep, you know, talking for too long because y'all can talk. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think this is just the first step mm -hmm. of something bigger. I think it's good that we accepted that this is an issue. Um, our parts, our roles to play. So kudos and thank you so much. Want to, you know, drop your comments, make sure to do so, and uh, we'd also love to hear from you. Again, thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>